one story where it says then the black person could look and see everything clearly. And then we hear from healing another blind person. And that blind person became a disciple. But here we have these 12 guys following him around, but they don't see anything clearly. They see the healings, they see the miracles. But they continue to miss the point. They are handicapped by a certain blindness of wanting to be inside and not understanding their role. Well, why did they commit to Jesus in the first place? Because they believed that Jesus was this long-awaited Messiah, a great leader who was going to come in, raise an army, kick the Romans out of Judea, and set them up to be a power in the world. And they wanted to be in that inner circle. They were tired of being on the outside. So they can't see who Jesus is because their vision is impaired by their longing for someone who will overthrow, be a new king, turning the world as they know it upside down with a, a press will be on top and everybody else on the bottom. And they will be on the inside. They have witnessed the power of Jesus. And they're tired of waiting. Waiting for their turn. They're waiting for their turn to be looked up to. They want their turn to be admired. Perhaps even feared. But the answer that they get is not what they want to hear. After James and John asked Jesus to allow us to sit on your right and the other on your left when you enter your glory, Jesus replies with, you don't even know what you're asking. Can you drink of the cup that I drink? Or receive the baptism that I receive? Oh yeah, we can, they answer. Thinking we can do whatever, eat whatever, that's going to get us closer to glory. We are with you. We can do that. But I think they have forgotten what sometimes we often forget. That God seldom uses the high and mighty, those in the in crowd, in the service of justice and mercy. In fact, so often, God does the opposite. God deliberately doesn't choose the powerful to do his will. In fact, if we made a list of those whom God has chosen, it's not a very flattering list. Moses stuttered. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. Jacob was a liar. David was an adulterer. Paul was a murderer, and so was Moses. Gideon and Thomas both doubted. And Jeremiah was depressed and sometimes even suicidal. And Jesus, from the wrong side of the tracks, poor and a convicted fellow. That's the power of the gospel. God so often uses what the world looks down upon to be agents of transformation. Yet the disciples, they want the fame and the glory, they want power and prestige. And Jesus asks, can you drink the cup that I drink or receive the baptism I receive? And sharing the cup of Christ means to walk the way of the crucified Christ. What does that mean? It means standing up for righteousness when all others are silent. It means speaking up for those who have lost their voice. It means being vilified and misunderstood when you do. It means speaking truth to power. It means disrupting that racist comment or joke at work. It means not seeing all people with skin different from yours as either threats to your safety or objects of your pity. It means being in this world, but most definitely not of this world. 
It means having a rich and disciplined life of prayer. It means being at peace with who you are and whose you are. Jesus promises his disciples not that they should be in glory with him, rewarded and happy. He promises that if they follow him, they will share with him in his suffering and challenges. The two disciples asked to sit next to Jesus in glory, one on his right and one on his left, not understanding when Jesus comes into his glory, it was not to be on the throne, but on a wooden cross, tortured and bleeding with two thieves, one on his right and one on his left. This is the message that the ancient followers of Jesus found it so hard to comprehend. But I don't think we're too far from where they were. Because even today, some that profess to follow Jesus still, like the disciples, just don't see it clearly. They don't get it right. They have constructed a Jesus of their longing. They have made Jesus everything from a golden calf, promising prosperity, money cometh, to a spirit of dominance and militarism, assuring manifest destiny. Looking for peace in life? Worried about the future? Need a perfect wife or husband? Jesus is the answer. <laughs> Want to be great? Jesus is the answer. That's the question many seekers ask. Underneath the questions, whatever your need, neon lights, Jesus is the answer. Now from what I see, this is the predominant presentation of Christianity in so many places these days. You have some need, perhaps, perhaps a need for peace, in a troubled life, the need for greater hope and confidence in the future, well, Jesus is the answer. And this is what I believe to be a somewhat misguided attempt to lure people toward the gospel, putting forth all the benefits of following Jesus without any sacrifice, without any benefit to anyone but yourself. a sense of serenity and hope in an often, often difficult and demanding world, dude, Jesus got you covered. How could you not respond to that? But here's the problem for us and here's the problem for the disciples in our text. Jesus is not a magic formula for getting what we want from God. Let me say that again. Jesus is not a magic formula for getting what we want out of God. Jesus is God's way of getting what God wants out of us. God wants a world, a world redeemed, restored to God. And like I learned back in my movement days, even freedom is not free. So even following Jesus is not without a cost. So okay, the disciples don't get it. But the failure for of the 12 to understand can still be a cost for us to hope. For each of us sometimes are blind to what discipleship requires. And the good news is Jesus never gave up on them. And Jesus doesn't give up on us either. God continues to speak to us. And Jesus continues to show us the upside down way of his kingdom. And cautions us 
along with his disciples that the path of following Jesus is not an easy one. The promise of discipleship is not that they should be in glory with him, rewarded and happy. The promise is if they follow him, they shall sh uh, share with him in his sufferings and challenges. If you don't believe me, just look at anyone who has dared to stand against tyranny and oppression. Because they believe that was the right thing to do because they believe that was the will of God. Just as John the Baptist, who they cut off his head. Just as Gandhi. Just as King, both assassinated. Even Malaya shot in the face. When you stand for what is true and right and you try to pull the world in a different way, direction, it is terrifying, it is dangerous, but that's who we say we follow. So it's easy to understand why Martin King said his eyes had seen the glory of the coming of the Lord and he wasn't afraid anymore because he was pulled towards that greater sense of transformation. Are you willing to put some skin in the game? Is the question. One of my favorite quotes um, from W.B. Du Bois was a commencement address he gave in 1930 to the graduating class of Howard University. And here he speaks eloquently about the cost of discipleship. He says, to increase abiding satisfaction for the masses of our people and for all people, someone must sacrifice something of their own happiness. And this is a duty only to those who recognize it as a duty. But the larger the number ready to sacrifice, the smaller the total sacrifice necessary. And he says, it's silly to tell intelligent human beings, be good and you will be happy. The truth is today, be good, be honorable, and be self-sacrificing, and you will not be happy. You will often be desperately unhappy. You may even be crucified, dead, and buried. And on the third day, you will be just as dead as the first. <laughs> but with the death of your happiness may easily come the increased happiness and satisfaction and fulfillment for other people, strangers, unborn babies, uncreated worlds. He says, if this is not sufficient incentive, don't try it. Remain hogs. But there comes a point where you must do or die. 1930, W.E.B. Du Bois. The sacrifice, but the more willing to do it, the less required and everybody benefits. As Jesus explains in his reproach to James and John, the kingdom is not who's in and who's out, nor is Christian greatness about who was on top and who was underfoot, or who has the big, biggest sanctuary, or the most visited website. My friends, the glory and greatness in Christ comes from seeing others, helping others, loving others, empowering others, resisting the forces of evil. It means sacrifice. As God in Christ sees, helps, loves, empowers, and Christ has sacrificed for us. 
It means believing that if we profess our belief in faith in Christ, that we can be, yes, part of a certain in crowd. Not with flash and bling, but rather what the Bible calls that great cloud of witnesses. When we worship, when we serve, when we speak truth to power, we go where that holy in crowd goes. And being in that in crowd and knowing what that holy in crowd knows, that the best place to be in the world is to be not entirely of the world. And for us, because I hope we would know we can have a joy that the world cannot give or the world cannot take away. Being in that holy in crowd knows that weeping will endure for a night, but joy will come. Knowing that we are never forsaken or forgotten that each one of us, every one of us, is made in the image and likeness of God. Knowing what the Lord does require of us. Justice, mercy, humility. But it will cost you something. As Du Bois said, but with your sacrifice made, easily come the increased happiness and satisfaction and fulfillment of other people, strangers, unborn babies, uncreated worlds. Yesterday at the CMA meeting, if any of you were there, there was a powerful sermon given by Reverend Jamie Fraser where he talked about us serving a ridiculous God. Ridiculous. This whole premise is ridiculous. You want more, give it away. You want power, serve. How ridiculous is that? But indeed, that is what we profess. We serve a ridiculous God, some a ridiculous premise, and we say that we believe that it is true, that indeed that is the only way that real change, that real transformation will come. Lord, may it be so. And if you are here today, and if you are looking for a place to join a group of outsiders working to align with Jesus, you are in the right place. And after church, please join myself or one of our deacons in the welcome table. And we would love to talk to you about being part of this holy in crowd, Pilgrim Congregational Church. Amen. Amen. Amen.